Thank you all for coming this evening to this talk. Many of you know me, but for those who don't, my name is Stephen Salel, and I am the Robert F. Lange Foundation Curator of Japanese Art across the street at the Honolulu Museum of Art. Today, we are happy that the new exhibition on Japanese manga entitled The Disasters of Peace Social Discontent in the Manga of Tsuge Taro and Katsumata Susumu opened. This is the second installment in our multi-year series exploring Japanese manga. And it continues until April 15th of next year. So if you didn't get a chance to see it today, come back. The Disasters of Peace features artwork by two artists who were involved in the Gekiga movement. Gekiga literally translates to dramatic pictures, but essentially it is mature, socially critical form of manga that became popular in the late 60s through the 80s, I'd say. And it was closely connected with the monthly magazine Garo which became sort of a voice for the Japanese counterculture movement. There is, to my knowledge, only one person who has dedicated his research to the study of this particular uh, genre of manga, and that is our guest speaker, Dr. Ryan Holmberg. Ryan received his PhD in art history from Yale in 2007, and his dissertation focused on the history of Gado. Recently, he was a resident at the Sainsbury Institute for the Study of Japanese Art and Culture, and he's currently the visiting associate professor at the University of Tokyo. In addition to frequently contributing articles to the Comics Journal, Art Forum International, Art in America, and other journals. He is actively editing and translating manga. His past publications include Trash Market, featuring the work of Tsuge Tado, which was published by Drawn in Quarterly in 2015. Some of his upcoming Translation projects include Slum Wolf, which is another translation of Tsuge Sensei's stories, and that will be published by the New York Review of Books in February. Also, Fukushima Devilfish, which features the work of Katsumata Susumu, will be published by Breakdown Press in March. In addition to this evening's presentation, if you're free tomorrow evening, in the courtyard behind the school here, we'll be having a Pechkucha event, which involves many speakers, including Ryan. It starts at 7 o'clock and continues until 9 o'clock. If you're familiar with Pechkucha, the participants, they show 20 slides and they talk for 20 seconds about each slide, so Ryan's talk will be exactly six minutes and 40 seconds long. And he'll be talking about the American influence on early Japanese comics. Tonight's presentation is entitled Garo and the Birth of Alternative Manga. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Ryan Holmberg. Um, so uh, thank you for having me to the Honolulu Museum of Art. Uh, University of Hawaii, especially to Stephen Solel for setting up the exhibition um, and my uh, week-long residency here in Honolulu. Re really enjoyed it. Um, today I'm going to talk about uh, kind of the history of the prehistory of the magazine and the early history of the magazine Garo, which was the magazine in which much of the work that's in the show across the street uh, initially appeared. Um, now looking, I prepared this about a year ago, this PowerPoint, and looking at it a couple of seconds ago, a couple of minutes ago, I realized that Tsuge Tado and Katsumata Susumu are neither in this uh, PowerPoint, which means <laughs> A, that my tastes have changed in the past year, but also uh, you should instead think about it as a nice supplement 
to the exhibition across the street. So what you don't get here, you'll get there and vice versa. Okay. So a lot of times when people talk about uh, the magazine Gatto, which was founded in 1964 and continued until 2002, publishing uh, almost on a monthly basis with the addition of some supplemental special issues of individual artists. Uh, they oftentimes call it uh, Japan's underground manga magazine. And what I want to do by starting off is explain to you why understanding alternative manga, literary manga, artistic manga, and calling it underground comics is uh, a little bit misleading. Um, underground comics is a term that comes mainly from the United U U.S. context and American underground comics. Um, it's a name that comes out of things that developed in the comics medium in the United States in the 1950s. Um, as you may know, how many of you are familiar general, generally with American comic book history? So, in, as you may know, you know superhero comics uh, kind of boomed uh, in the late 30s and up to the end of World War II and then kind of died out until they had a resurgence in the late 50s and then especially in the 1960s. In the interim, uh, comics for a wider readership, for adolescent, potentially a, a adult readership, uh, developed um, around various types of themes, especially crime, uh, horror, and mystery themes. Uh, EC Comics uh, was the main uh, perpetrator in these kind of comics, uh, and they took on a wide number of issues, um, some of it quite gory and gratuitous, but oftentimes a lot of it had very smartly written and dealing with contemporary social issues in the United States, uh, like uh, the KKK, uh, about uh, discrimination against uh, Hispanic immigrants. Um, there's even some science fiction stories that deal with uh, racial discrimination in the United States. Um, but the content was gory, it included drugs, it included beheaded women and dead bodies, and the, a number of Christian groups got together in the 1940s and early 50s and uh, joined forces with uh, conservative politicians to basically force, ultimately force the comic book industry to self-censor itself before it was actually censored by the law. So something it was instituted in 1954 called the Comics Code. Um, it was a self-censorship of the Comics Code and it stipulated that certain types of lewd or obscene or gory or non-child content would not appear in comic books in the United States. Now what this, mean, what this means is that comics in this case means a specific kind of format of book with a specific distribution uh, context. So what EC Comics did was they started making, rather than comics, uh, they made comic magazines, which had a different kind of distribution uh, network. Uh, one of the first comic magazines, uh, it was initially be, it was a comic book and then it was reformed as a magazine, was MAD, which you probably know and still exists today. It's had a massive impact on uh, American uh, culture and also on Japanese manga in the 1960s. It had a significant impact. Um, they were doing many parodies of uh, kind of white bread American suburban life, as you see on the left, kind of a, a mock uh, prom. I guess about a high school uh, beauty contest uh, picture. And they also, subsequently, the person who created MAD, named Harvey Kurtzman, who also did a number of very trenchant crime and war comics for EC Comics, uh, went on uh, independently and helped found a magazine called Help uh, in 1960, which is a mix of kind of humor and comics uh, for uh, adults. Now, MAD, Help and MAD magazine specifically inspired a number of uh, young artists at uh, American universities and especially on uh, non-university students on the West Coast and in New York uh, to make their own comic magazines or contribute political cartoons to non-comic magazines like uh, the East Village Other, as you see on the right. And what you see on the left is a, uh, a self-printed stapled magazine, comics magazine, uh, by someone named uh, Jackson uh, called God Knows. I think it was published in in Berkeley in 1964, which many people consider as the first underground comic book, an underground in the sense that it was self-published, self-distributed, and uh, contained content that otherwise would be deemed uh, explicit or obscene or politically incorrect uh, in contemporary American society. Now, you probably know of Zap. Zap was created in 19, uh, I believe 1967, uh, 
issue number zero comes out after oh, 1968. Issue zero comes out after 19 after issue number one. Uh, Zap Comics run by R. Crumb. Um, it was distributed initially out of uh, by R. Crumb himself and his girlfriend out of a baby carriage strolling the Haight Ashbury. Um, and then subsequently, Zap and related underground comics were distributed through head shops uh, across the West Coast and then across the United States, uh, dealing with a number of things: uh, contemporary hippie culture, uh, changing sexual mores, um, kind of very lewd skewering of American uh, suburban uh, dreams on uh, sitcoms. Um, also very sharp and sometimes regarded to be problematic uh, dealings with uh, white racism and uh, history of black caricature within American comics. Um, also, uh, Crumb, like many of his colleagues, uh, were heavy pot smokers and LSD acid droppers. So uh, some jokey uh, ads on the back of Zap telling you how to get stoned properly. And then Robert Crumb also making his own comics while uh, high. Um, here you have uh, oh, uh, a famous work called Abstract Expressionist Ultra Super Modernistic Comics. And if, as you can see here, if you know anything about, and this is 1967, it kind of shows you also to the degree to which uh, comic book artists, even the most avant-garde, how little they knew about contemporary art, given that abstract expressionism would have kind of been a passe thing for many people by 1967. And it's a very specific kind of abstract expressionism, right? It's not gesture abstraction, it's kind of Adolf Gottlieb and that crew's kind of use of Jungian uh, symbolism within a gestural context. Um, also people, someone like Victor Moscaso, who is better known as a post-psychedelic poster designer for the, the rock scene in San Francisco, um, also doing kind of psychedelic metamorphic comics with established animation and uh, cartoon characters, in this case, um, Mickey Mouse and Donald Duck. And then also at the, and then the underground comics develops very quickly after Zap, uh, creating uh, the first uh, full-on feminist comic book, Women's Comics, which starts in 1972, and recently has been reissued in a very nice, uh, very expensive uh, re-edition from Fanagraphics, which is, is really great if you can get your hands on it through the library. Um, and then also skewering of uh, certain political developments elsewhere in the, in the world, like the Cultural Revolution in China, that hard left people um, had a kind of a rosy view of, but uh, artists uh, within the underground comics uh, movement um, had a less uh, savory take on. Right. Now, <clears throat> Garo is, an alternative manga is not underground comics because it was never distributed um, in that way. It was, it was never self-distributed. It was never self-printed or self-published. And it also very rarely uh, dealt with uh, overtly obscene content. Um, now, comic manga itself also dealt with its kind of non-comics code, but its kind of anti-comics persecution in the 1950s. Uh, it peaks, even going back to the 1930s and 40s, uh, there are groups that say that comics are inappropriate uh, for anything but small children. Any, anything above small children should read things more serious. Um, so there's something called the Aksho Tsuiho Undo, which is basically an evil book uh, purging campaign. Uh, it, peaks in 19, it peaks in 1955. Um, it especially targets uh, mainstream magazines. Um, but one thing that's important to remember in the development of alternative manga is that there was an alternative distribution network initially, but it wasn't underground comics. It was something called uh, Kashi Honya, uh, which means rental bookstores. And rental bookstores are basically like video rental stores, uh, but they rented out books. And for, the, for in the 1950s, especially in the 1950s and until about the mid-1960s, late 1960s, Kashihonya were not only a way of distributing uh, books, but it was books, meaning both fiction and comics, were also created specifically for rental bookstores. So there was two markets for manga in the 1950s and until the late 1960s. One was magazines um, that uh, published things like this, Tezuka Osamu's Astro Boy, most of these magazines were based, or all, almost all these magazines were based in Tokyo, 
And artists like Tezuka, who is born uh, outside of Osaka, uh, grow up out of, outside of Osaka and begins his career near Osaka because the publishing industry is centered in Tokyo. Most of them end up moving to Tokyo over the course of the 1950s. Uh, other magazines look like this. Uh, manga Shonen, which is an important magazine uh, in the history of manga because of its had a, a, a last 20 pages were uh, committed to uh, children and adolescents who were reading the magazine to submit their own submissions. And that's how many artists got their start. But you can see as the cover, this very sticky cover, that it was heavily influenced by Disney, as was Tezuka. This was a monthly magazine, and something that really changes the manga industry is in 1959, uh, the two main, two of the main publishers publishing children's material, um, Shogakkan and Kodansha, decide to do weekly manga magazines. This is also the time when TV starts getting big in Japan, and basically manga magazines and big publishers wanted to time serial, car uh, co comic serialization to the weekly programming schedule of, of televisions. What this does, of course, is also speed up production in a major way, which also means that people have to be very careful of the kind of work they publish, or, or the magazine publishes, because they want to ensure that it makes money. So a lot of the comics that are appearing in things like Shonen Magazine, these weekly comics, are, are adaptations of uh, TV animation series, or things that were immediately adapted into TV animation series. There's a strong energy, even on the weekly cycle, between weekly manga magazines and kind of a bigger children's entertainment complex in the, in the 1950s and 1960s that, that, that continues today. You know, basically no manga that you read in Shonen Jump doesn't have some kind of cross-platform, uh, what they call media mix, um, today, and that's been the case since the early, uh, 1959. Now, while this is going on in Tokyo, specifically in Osaka, but not only in Osaka, but specifically in Osaka, the rental uh, book market takes off and becomes, from 1953 on to about 1968, becomes one of the primary means for doing a different type of manga. Now, it's different, A, because you don't have to deal with the big budgets of uh, big publishing houses, you have a lot more freedom of expression. Another important thing is that uh, there are anthologies, monthly anthologies of stories of maybe 400 pages of, uh, with 30 page, collection, collection of 30 page stories. But it also gives the opportunity, to, many of the books are also 130, 128 page single volume books. So this is basically the beginning, uh, you might say, of the graphic novel. Um, in Japan in the 1950s, even though there were full-on uh, manga books uh, back into the 1930s. But in terms of a novel, in, in, in the sense of a kind of a more closely plotted story, uh, the graphic novel arguably began in Japan in the mid-1950s. Um, it also uh, used content that was more targeted towards adolescents and young adults. Um, many of the artists were influenced by American and French mystery fiction, uh, noir films uh, and Japanese uh, adaptations uh, thereof. Uh, the most famous and kind of the beginning of this, one of the big, one of the big early works, is this work by Tatsumi Yoshihiro, who you might know. Uh, this work called Black Blizzard was translated by John and Quarterly into English about 12 years, 10 years ago. Um, it's an, an un uncredited adaptation of a mystery story by a uh, well-known mystery writer at the time named Shimada uh, Kazuo about two fugitives um, who are in a train that train wrecks and they have to run from the police, uh, but they, just, they realize that they can't run alone through the together through the blizzard, so they decide that one person has, to, has their hand cut off so the other one might live. And the other important thing about this is the stylistic traits. Uh, Gekiga was the name that Tatsumi came up with this non-manga. He didn't like the word manga because manga signified comedy and things for children. So he came up for, with a new world called Gekiga, dramatic pictures. And Gekiga came to mean a lot of things, but one of the main things that it meant at the time was trying to, trying to create comics that were mainly about visual storytelling, uh, rather than comics that were about uh, driven by a combination of narrative text and images. Um, here you'll see that there's a lot of speech, but most of the speech in Gekiga is, uh, sorry, you'll see a lot of text, but most of the text in Gekiga is speech. So all, everything that was part of the plot, part of the story, either had to be 
uh, kind of laterally told through speech balloons or demonstrated through images. And also because these artists were looking a lot at uh, film, contemporary film, mystery film, they're also heavily influenced by certain types of cinematic breakdowns used in contemporary mystery film in the 1950s. Um, and another thing that you'll notice is that unlike Tezuka's drawing, which is very tight and cute and circular, um, that a lot of times Gekiga became more about expressionistic uh, brushwork and ink work. And this especially came out in Black Blizzard, a story which occurs totally inside of a blizzard. So you have all these kind of expressionistic scratches all over the, the um, all over the image, which kind of double as speed lines and sound effects also. So it's a very kind of symphonic and expressionistic form of uh, making a more dramatic type of comic book. Now this is just to show you some covers of uh, Kashihon Gekiga anthologies, uh, all mystery and horror, and, and subsequently uh, hard-boiled fiction. Uh, one on the right cover I really like, Kao, uh, the face, and the most famous uh, one that was edited by Tatsumi called Kage, um, Shadow. Um, eventually, Gekiga in the Kashihon format went from single volume books to multi volume books, sometimes running to 12 or 13 volumes on no particular production scale, maybe one a month. Um, some of the most famous uh, on the right, Sato Masaki. Um, who was part of Tatsumi's group. He produced something called Hard Boiled Magazine in the early 1960s, uh, published by Sanyosha, which is, uh, both of these were published by Sanyosha, which later became Serindo, which published Garo. Uh, and another one on the left, uh, the early first edition of Kitaro, Mizuki Shigeru's Kitaro, Gege no Kitaro, was first released as uh, Hakaba no Kitaro, oh, this is a, a Kitaro Yawa, this is a later edition in the 1960s. And most of you probably know uh, the character of Kitaro, the kind of yokai ghost hunting uh, hero who was adapted in the animation in the late 1960s. Uh, he has his roots in Kashihon manga of uh, circa 1960. Um, also very bloody things, a lot of uh, jidai, sub, bloody samurai jidaigeki uh, period pieces. One of the most famous that was eventually banned uh, uh, Burns was something known as Chidaruma Kempo by an artist named Hirata Hiroshi. Um, it was banned because there was pressure by uh, the Buraku Kaiho Dome, which is the Buraku Liberation League. It's a, a political organization fighting for the rights of a discriminated caste uh, within Japan. This is a story about a samurai who is Buraku, but that's hidden, and then he's outed, and then he freaks out and starts killing everybody in the castle, and eventually they come back and kill him. That doesn't, they, they dis, dismember his legs, that doesn't stop him, he attaches blades to his stumps and then starts killing the rest of the people in the castle. This was eventually burned, not because of its gruesome content, because of, but of certain in, uh, politically incorrect uh, verbiage relating to the Buraku. And I'll just say that uh, I really want to translate this and get this out into English in the next year or two. It's, it's, it's available in, in Japanese now, it's, very, it's an important work in the development of Kashihon manga. And, and really crazy. Um, now, uh, another artist um, who was based in Tokyo but initially publishing Kashihon manga was Shirato Sanpei. And Shirato Sanpei is important because he went on to become the, the founder and funder of Gato in its early years. Now, he started off doing work like this, not samurai manga, but oh, this is a samurai manga. He starts doing samurai manga, but then he becomes famous for doing ninja manga. Um, this is one of his earlier works. Um, you see here, kind of done in a quasi, kind of keeps Tezuka's cartoony style. Um, he also does non-period pieces, uh, uh, works treating contemporary topics. Uh, most famous work from 1959 is called The Disappearing Girl. Uh, the Disappearing Girl, who you see on the left, uh, she is uh, born in Hiroshima. Her, mo her mother, she's still an infant in the womb at the time that the A-bomb drops on Hiroshima in 1945. After she's born, her mother dies. She suffers from unknown illnesses that we come to learn are leukemia from radiation exposure during the bomb. She later teams up with this ogre type guy who's living in the mountains who we later learn, out, learn is a Korean hiding out in the Japanese mountains who was previously brought to Japan as conscript laborer in a Japanese mine. So you have these these two kind of marginalized people teaming up, right? The 
the marginalized Korean, the ex-colonial citizen in Japan who's been forgotten by the state. Um, and at this time, it would have been even more problematic because Korea split and a lot of Koreans didn't have a home to go back to because North Korea wasn't recognized as a state. And then on the left, you have the Hibaksha, the Hiroshima Hibaksha, which were suffering discrimination in society. So teaming up to become kind of a, kind of a team of sympathy of the, of the marginalized in Japan. Now, most important Kashihon manga, and one of my most favorite manga, is uh, The Legend of Kagemaru, uh, Ninja Martial Arts Scroll, usually just called Ninja Bugecho in uh, Japanese. It was a total of 16 volumes, I believe, about 2,000 pages. Uh, it is a ninja story. It is a story about a ninja who speaks like a left-wing activist. He organizes the peasants. But the peasants are also being organized simultaneously by uh, the nearby Pure Land Buddhist temple. So there's some conflict about who they should follow. Uh, in both cases, they're uprising because the local samurai are taking uh, their rice and causing such distress that many of them are starving. And then they're brutally uh, murdered by the samurai whenever they complain. So Kagemaru, the ninja, shows up and starts helping the peasants organize in different ways. Uh, many kind of very active expressionistic scenes like this, uh, lots of blood that actually ran, ran afoul of some PTA groups and uh, women's groups at the time. Uh, images like this of drought causing uprisings, uh, peasant rebellions. And images like this, kind of two-page uh, cinematic spreads of the peasants arming themselves and revolting against, in this case, uh, local merchants who are hoarding rice. And then here, the peasant's rebellion only partially succeeding, and then the brutal punishment that they have to endure to death uh, by local samurai. And as I was looking through this PowerPoint right before this presentation, I just remembered that here you have the bottom, you have an explicit reference to Goya, Francisco Goya's disaster of uh, war. So. If this is one of the beginnings of alternative manga, you can, in fact, say that potentially Goya is somewhere lightly in the roots of, of uh, the beginnings of alternative manga. Now, Shirato Sanpei's father was a leader, a painter, and a leader of the proletarian arts movement before World War II. Uh, he had books of works by Goya, Kathy Kolwitz, um, etc. So Shirato Sanpei was exposed more than most manga artists at the time kind of a more highbrow traditional Western art history uh, visual database when he was creating work. Now Ninja Bugecho uh, is also important because it becomes, first of all, the first manga uh, about which many university and uh, independent intellectuals start writing manga criticism about. The first substantial body of manga criticism comes out in the early 60s around Ninja Bugecho. Um, it's reprinted in a paperback format in the mid-1960s, which leads to major filmmakers like Oshima Nagisa, who you might know. He made a, a kind of an anime-type adaptation of uh, Ninja Bugecho in 1967. And I say anime-type because what he did was he took the original artwork, borrowed it from Shirato Sanpei, and shot it cinematically with kind of uh, the, the camera roving over different scenes. Kind of like what Steven did for the uh, video uh, if you go to the exhibition, you'll see there's a video installation showing some of the works broken down by panel. So Oshima did a full-length film of Ninja Bugecho. So thereby, Shirato Sanpei was kind of part of the counterculture, a center part of the counterculture and university students which, which, had, which had begun reading manga in the mid-1960s. Now while Shirato Sanpei had this kind of hardcore um, alternative counterculture side, he also had to make a living, and so therefore he was making many comics for the youth market, for children's manga magazines. And they were also very widely popular. Uh, one of the most famous is called, what you see on the left, is Sasuke, which was originally a manga serialization that published as a hardcover book. And the hardcover book was mainly for kashihon circulation. So by the 1960s, you see a number of publishers and artists working for both the magazine market and also the Kashihon market, market, or adapting their work for both markets. And on the right, you see a number of mainstream manga magazines with covers by Shirato Sanpei, uh, 
figure called uh, the top left of that four panel image and the bottom one with the guy with the axe. Uh, that's Watari. And Watari is also important because Hayao Miyazaki of Studio Ghibli was a huge Garo and Shirato fan. And if you go back, if you're familiar with 1960s Toei animation, uh, there's one film that's famous as kind of like the proto Ghibli film called, uh, what's it called? Hole's Prince of the Sun, it's this Viking mythology. Uh, you'll see that the main boy character is basically kind of a Watari type character. And Miyazaki has written subsequently how Nausicaa was kind of semi influenced by Shirato Sampe's um, ecological themes, oftentimes. So, Garo, not only was Shirato Sampe popular in the counterculture and popular in the mainstream culture, he's also had a huge impact subsequently on, on the history of Japanese uh, manga and anime. Now, with the funds that Shirato Sampe is making from um, these other manga, these manga for kids, he decides to found his own manga magazine. And he teams up with someone named Nagai Katsuichi, who is a publisher who had been active in the Hashihon market since the 1950s. That Disappearing Girl uh, work that I showed you, and that Kitaro work, and that Hardboiled magazine, they were all published by Nagai Katsuichi under different uh, publishing names through the 1950s and the early 1960s. He creates a new publisher, which is initially supposed to be a Kashihon publisher called Seirindo in 1962, I believe. And then they decide to make a magazine called Gato in 1964. And if you ever have the opportunity to see the early issues of Gato, um, it's interesting because the covers are kind of hard cardboard stock, which is kind of weird. And if you find some of the old issues for sale, you'll notice that some of them have uh, thick cords running through the binding, which is typically what Kashihon rental bookshops did to fortify books. So what this means is that even though it's formatted as a monthly manga magazine for the newsstands, initially probably Shirato and the publisher Nagai Katsuichi also thought that it might circulate on the Kashihon market. And there's certain markings that from, if you, from, from used books that you know that it actually did circulate on the Kashihon market initially. So here, what you're seeing on the left is a cover of the first issue of Garo, and then a representative issue later on, uh, featuring images from Shirato's main work. Um, Shirato contributed about 100, from 100 to 200 pages a month uh, to this magazine for free, um, in addition to creating probably three or 400 pages a month uh, for other magazines. Of course, he didn't make it all himself. Um, he had a studio of about six or seven people. Um, uh, one of the main people who was working for him and worked on Garo was someone named Kojima Goseki, uh, who went on to create Lone Wolf and Cub in the 1970s. So even though Legend of Kamui, which is the main manga in Garo, um, is credited to Shirato Sanpei, it was actually drawn by Kojima Goseki. Um, Shirato Sanpei would do the pencils and the story, and then Kojima Goseki was hired to do the, the ink, inking. But this story um, is basically about the lead character's name is Kamui. And the reason Kamui is a, uh, a boy born of Burakumin parents, of this outcast uh, caste, um, he gets tired of the discriminations his community is subject to. So he learns ninjutsu and becomes a ninja to help his uh, community fight off uh, not only the local samurai, but the nearby peasants community, which also discriminates against the Burakumi. Um, now he teams, I'm skipping some of you, I know all these images are uh, very suggestive, but I'm just going to race ahead. Um, here's some images of uh, the Burakumi community, and I'd probably go into this more detail if this was a group that knew a lot about Japanese history, but uh, you know, Shirato Sampe did quite a bit of historical research about what potentially Burakumi communities uh, look like uh, in the Edo period, in the pre-Edo period. Um, they were mainly uh, people who worked with animals, uh, dead carcasses to make uh, leather, um, also processing uh, the animal parts for different purposes. And here you can see on the top right uh, them drying hides. And the hides would have uh, eventually been used, uh, I think mainly for armor and saddles uh, for the samurai. Um, here you can see on the, on, the, you know, on the right, they go to the, the nearby peasant village to uh, dispose a uh, recently dead horse. Uh, they're doing the peasants a favor by doing this. It is also their socially bound duty to do so. Uh, 
But as you can see on the bottom right, the peasant children uh, throw rocks at the Burakumi. So this was uh, an issue that wasn't really talked about in Japan at the time, and to some, to some extent even now not talked about in Japan. Uh, the Burakumi continue to exist uh, in a mild form today, but we're still kind of a serious political and social issue uh, in the mid 20th century. And while this manga is very interesting to read and very action heavy, there's also these kind of passages that are dealing with kind of a forgotten his, uh, history of Japanese society. So you can kind of think of Gado initially, even though it became known as kind of the avant-garde literary manga magazine, it was basically, uh, at least Shirato's contribution was, probably can be understood as kind of an alternative Japanese history textbook in manga form. He was trying to educate Japanese children about forgotten aspects of Japanese history that were not being taught in school textbooks. And while school textbooks became if any of you know Japanese history, how Japan represents uh, its history became a real big issue in the 1980s and 90s, already in the 1950s and 60s where uh, historians and school teachers dealing with uh, heavy censorship by the LDP, kind of the right-leaning government, about what constituted proper education in school. So this is kind of like a counter history book in manga form. Brutality against uh, the local peasants when they complain. Uh, Kabui arming himself. Um, so Kamui, this Burakumin child, is, was supposed to be the initial hero. Uh, and the reason he's called Kamui is that's an Ainu word. Ainu are the people of northern Japan. Um, he was supposed to eventually travel to Hokkaido to team up with the Ainu to have this kind of Ainu Burakumin. Uh, unity and fighting against uh, the oppressions of mainland Japan. That story never happens. Uh, Kamui then instead shifts to this person, Shosuke, which is a peasant child who learns, teaches himself how to read, and therefore, because he can read, he knows how to uh, create new types of agriculture which benefit the local peasants, um, and he's also able to read the ledgers that the local merchants and samurai keep to know how much uh, the peasants are being ripped off in terms of how much produce that uh, the, the merchants take. So just these kind of very detailed images of uh, farming in pre-modern Japan. With very long texts at the bottom right about how agriculture was conducted uh, 300 years ago in Japan. This is set in the early 17th century. Showing the agricultural seasons harvests in detail. This manga goes on for seven years and 7,000 pages. Here showing, what is this showing? This is showing, so they're measuring the rice and they're showing how the samurai cheat by how they level the, the masu, the, 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 what do you call it, cube, what is this, this cup, which is a measuring device for rice and apparently, if any rice that falls off uh, in a certain area becomes a samurai's, if it's, unless it, well, if it falls off in a different area, it becomes the peasant's. So it shows the samurai always leveling the rice so that the leveled off rice becomes there, and the, and the peasant's looking on it more. And then Shosuke, uh, being educated, figures out new ways, easier ways to thresh rice. And then he decides that the best way to improve conditions is also to educate his peers. So he takes the children of the village, they go hide under a rock, and they learn kanji so that they can read uh, the ledgers. Uh, eventually, in, in, Kam in Legend of Kamui, the peasants have had enough, and they attack the merchant houses as such, uh, coming up with impossible weapons like this flying boulder. And then at the same time, there's these scenes where Shosuke is telling his uh, co uh, fellow peasants about how important scholarship and learning is. At the same time in Garo, uh, Shirato Sampei and his studio were running uh, political columns aimed for its children's readership about how the Japanese government also was kind of abusing um, education in order to uh, guide Japan perhaps back towards war. This is an uh, illustration you see from one of the cartoons. So there's a kind of a, co a resonance between 
the manga contact and the context content in the political columns in Garo. Eventually, Shosuke, this articulate peasant, this hero of words, which is a very strange thing in manga, right? Most manga uh, heroes are heroes of action. Shosuke was a hero of words. So in, in Kamui, then, you have a lot of speech balloons, much more than any, more, any, more manga, any other manga, uh, because it's hero is someone who speaks and convinces people and improves life through discourse. But eventually, Shosuke's tongue is ripped out of his head, after the samurai uh, figure out what problems his, his education is causing, and Kamui then comes to kind of a gross finish in 1971. Now, in the, in the meantime, um, I should say that oftentimes people read themes like this against uh, what was happening uh, in Japanese politics at the time, that uh, Japanese campuses were in uprising and revolt in the late 1960s against corruption charges on campus, against collusion between university education and the government in the Vietnam War. Uh, increased police presence and freedom in the late 60s kind of crushes those political movements. And the legend of Kamui and how it ends grossly is kind of seen as a reflection of the uh, collapse of uh, left-wing political movements in the late 60s. Now also a major co contributor to Gato is Mizuki Shigeru, who is famous as Kitaro, as I mentioned before. He rewrites certain chapters of Kitaro for Garo uh, in the late 1960s. In the meantime, he also does short stories criticizing modern society. Um, what you see on the right is a story about a uh, young man from the countryside. If I remember right, he goes away to Tokyo, uh, and then he, he gets educated in Tokyo. He becomes urbanized. He believes in science. Then he returns to his hometown in the Japanese countryside. And his mother says, uh, there's this namahage mask, it's a mask of a certain kind of Japanese demon from the north. Um, his mother says, don't you dare put on that mask, it's cursed. And he says, what is this uh, you know, non-cultural, non-scientific way of viewing? What is this super superstition? So he puts on the mask, and then when he tries to take it off, he discovers that he himself has a namahage uh, mask uh, face. So Mizuki did a number of stories like this where kind of Japanese uh, superstition, kind of old rural beliefs, kind of trump uh, scientific uh, society. And it's kind of a criticism uh, by Mizuki saying that uh, modernization is not everything um, and should not be uh, embraced um, as everything in Japanese society. Now another major figure is Tsuge Yoshiharu, uh, who is of immediate interest because he is the elder brother of Tsuge Tadao. Um, Tsuge who's in the, in the museum show, uh, Tsuge Yoshiharu, as you can see on the right, had been active as an artist on the Kashihon market since the 1950s. Um, one of his first big hits was what you see on the right called uh, Ninja Kicho, Secret Scrolls of the Ninja. Uh, it was kind of a knockoff of Shirato Sanpei's Ninja Bugecho. And Tsuge Tado helped Tsuge Yoshiharu write this. So Tsuge Tado also was writing uh, works for the Kashihon market, usually under his brother's guidance. Uh, Tsugi Yoshihara became kind of a leading light next to Shirato of uh, Ingaro, doing kind of short literary manga uh, about travel narratives, kind of surreal stories. Um, I'm going to skip ahead. Um, uh, this is the most famous work. Uh, the most famous work that Tsuge did was a work called Nejishiki, which translates roughly as uh, the screw style or screw ceremony. Uh, it's called the screw because this character that you see on the right at the beginning of the manga, he rises out of the ocean. Um, he says that he has an injury on his arm. He doesn't know where he got it. Meanwhile, warplanes are flying overhead so that we know it's during World War II. He goes into a nearby fishing village. He asks various people for help. Uh, they refuse them help through kind of weird circumlocutions. He, uh, meanwhile, in the background, these weird images that have nothing to do uh, directly with the story, but have kind of an allegorical meaning, start appearing behind his head. Um, eventually, let's see, uh, he loses his way trying to find help. Kind of a uh, kind of interesting use of two colors here, uh, right? Kind of an orange spotlighting the character, and he talks about how how much how much difficulty he's having finding his way. And meanwhile, all these signposts are kind of doubling as empty speech balloons. The signposts themselves are not helping him find his way at all. Um, 
eventually he solves his problem by uh, discovering a female doctor who doubles as a prostitute, um, and then he kind of sails, oh, I don't have the last image, but he sails, he motorboats away from the island at the end. So everyone, a lot of people have written about this work at the time, people were very confused by what it meant. Um, they read it as kind of a coming of age story for Japanese youth. Um, of course, at this time and still today, in the sex industry was very vibrant in Japan, so visiting a prostitute was perhaps a kind of common uh, thing that one did in 1960s uh, Japan. But if you read the manga closely, it's set during World War II. There's other references to the war, like you have this image on the bottom left, which actually comes from a contemporary photograph, but I think for contemporary Japanese, would have reminded people of, of uh, school textbooks uh, published during World War II uh, featuring marching soldiers for kids. Uh, there's other references to the war. So I kind of read this work as a story about the uh, return of uh, the Japanese war dead to Japan and Japan not being able to fully deal with them in different ways. Uh, I won't go into further detail, but uh, moving ahead. Uh, in addition, another major artist, uh, someone who I've translated a few volumes of, an uh, artist named Hayashi Seichi. Um, I don't know if you have it here, but Hayashi Seichi is well known in Japan um, as the designer of the character for a type of candy called Ko Umechan. If you go into any konbini, convenience store in Japan, they'll have packets of, of this sour cherry candy called Ko Umechan. He designed that in the 1970s, is well known for that in Japan. Uh, prior to that, he created experimental manga while also working at Toei Animation Studios. He sometimes worked with Miyazaki and other uh, famous stars. Um, so this is kind of covers and uh, design work by Hayashi from that period. Um, he created kind of uh, spoofs, not, he created spoofs of the Vietnam War and the influx of American culture. Uh, sometimes using uh, a couple of works he uses Batman. Batman here is a buffoon who arrives saying that he is the world hero uh, of justice. Uh, it turns out that the frogs who represent Japan, Japanese youth, uh, don't trust him and they start bombarding him. Right? Uh, he also sources from uh, Japanese woodblock prints to make kind of pop culture manga, a uh, pop manga uh, influenced by uh, contemporary pop art. Uh, this one using uh, Kintaro, a famous mythological boy, um, and mixing it in, I think Batman and Superman also appear here, as well as Prince, Prince of Courtesans by people like uh, Utamaro, famous woodblock print artists. So kind of an early example of mixing kind of pop art aesthetics with comics and with Japanese woodblock prints. Uh, Hayashi also made uh, heavily coded but very sharp and uh, violent critiques of Japan's war generation, those who fought during the war, and their refusal to deal with war responsibility about violence committed against uh, men and especially women on the continent in Korea, China, uh, during World War II. Uh, here is a work called uh, Red Bird, Little Bird. Uh, it's structured as this kind of uh, ambiguous flashback by a middle-aged Japanese man uh, and it features this scene at the beginning of Japanese soldiers underneath this radiating rising sun uh, raping uh, a woman. Uh, the images, I don't have the source images, but the source images here he traced from a contemporary pink film posters, so soft porn posters, and also recently released uh, formally censored images of uh, violence by Japanese soldiers in, in China. So you have uh, interesting use of photography and collage and, and kind of coded critiques of Japanese war responsibility happening in Garo. Um, now, Hayashi is best known for this graphic novel that he made uh, called Red Colored Elegy. It's about two struggling uh, animators um, who are working at a place that looks like Toei or one of this, uh, the subcontractors uh, under Toei. Um, it, used, it became so popular eventually that it was adapted into a movie, and on the right it was also adapted into a pop song. This is a record album cover. Uh, it's been translated into English. A paperback edition is about to come out. Um, I, have a, I have a super long essay in it, in it about this uh, 
comic and uh, Hayashi's time at Toei Animation. So if you're interested in Hayashi or Gato or even an animation, um, it's fairly informative, probably more than you might want to know for reading a graphic novel. Um, so this is kind of some of the images. Um, it's creative use of kind of tracing, typography, um, a kind of a flat look that was semi-inspired by uh, pre-World War II era illustration in Japan. It's a romance story. Uh, images, the reason that this is black and white and this is this off color is because this is scanned from Gato and the other one was scanned from a book edition. Um, uh, difficulties with parents not understanding why children would want to live alone with a boyfriend in the city, um, etc. Um, uh, Hayashi was also heavily influenced by Godard, uh, Jean-Luc Godard, by New Age Cinema, and in Japan, Suzuki Seijun. I don't know how many of you have seen Suzuki, Suzuki Seijun's films, like Tokyo Drifter. It's kind of very Baroque Yakuza films from the late 60s. So here's an artist who's adapting kind of the avant-garde of cinema into manga form in the late 60s. Um, doing even more avant-garde things with someone named uh, Sasaki Maki. Uh, he was heavily influenced by the Beatles uh, and the British wave of rock. Uh, he was also influenced subsequently by R. Crumb. You kind of see stylization here on the right for a, a, a magazine cover from the 70s. Uh, he did non-narrative comics, comics that were based on symbols that are perhaps not symbols, but just kind of graphic uh, elements. Um, he would create these non-story stories of about 20 pages long, uh, featuring recurrent motifs like uh, the American GI, fat GI that you see at the left, uh, kind of these hippie boys, um, different types of birds, symbols, uh, a text that was nonsense, uh, references to contemporary pop culture, and he would make uh, these pages, uh, oftentimes based off a collage scrapbook that he made for himself. He would oftentimes rearrange the pages uh, right just prior to printing. He would shuffle them and then send them off to the printer. Um, and I really like this image at the bottom, uh, on the left page, bottom right, where the guy is swiping away this uh, wood uh, block building. It's kind of like how Sasaki Maki made his manga. He would build something up and then he would swipe it away. But as you can see on the outside of the panel, these arrows go around and around, right? So as readers, he might have destroyed the architecture of the story, but we kind of reconstruct the architecture of the story ourselves by looking at the repeating symbols and always being compelled to think that there is a narrative because it's arranged as a sequential comic page. Uh, other other works by Sasaki Maki, and you can read Sasaki Maki in translation. There's a book called uh, Ding Dong Circus, uh, published by Breakdown Press, that came out a couple years ago. Uh, Sasaki Maki subsequently went on to become a children's book illustrator, and also collaborated with Murakami Haruki. Uh, Haruki Murakami, he uh, illustrated his first and many of his uh, novel uh, covers of his Murakami's novels. Um, also collaborated with something called, what's it called, Fushigi no Toshoka, Mysterious Library, which I think was translated recently into English. And if you get the Breakdown Press edition, there's a little blurb on the back by Murakami uh, uh, praising uh, Sasaki Maki, which is just to say again that major figures today in Japanese culture and literature uh, were big Gato fans. Uh, other, also works like this, uh, experimenting with a total lack of speech balloon, uh, text, even though including speech balloons. Um, and just to kind of close up, uh, showing you some uh, images by artists who have yet to be translated, but may be translated in English in the next few years. Uh, an artist named Abe Shinichi. Um, Abe Shinichi was uh, the kind of leading member of a group of artists who debuted in the early 70s in Gato, who were kind of li li living uh, kind of very derelict bohemian lives in the west part of Tokyo, uh, writing about their everyday life. Uh, their problems with their girlfriends, uh, their misogynistic behavior towards their girlfriends, uh, their nights of drinking and vomiting. Uh, uh, stories that nonetheless, despite being oftentimes pedestrian subject matter, introduced into alternative manga kind of a focus on everyday life. Um, here you have a cover by Abe Shinichi on the right from 72 and a kind of an interesting uh, page on the left of kind of the same image, kind of doubled almost with slight differences. 
uh, full page spreads like this. You know, uh, uh, pages like this would typically not be possible in regular manga magazines, uh, just because of the amount of real estate they take up um, and kind of the uh, de-skilled uh, quality um, of the drawing. Uh, many manga artists at this point, many Gato artists, started using very scratchy, sketchy drawing. And that kind of begins with Tsuge Tadao, who's in the exhibition, but becomes heavily popularized uh, by uh, these artists. And subsequently in Gato, a term develops called uh, heta uma, which means bad, good, which means that the people are intentionally, they, they draw, they can draw well, but they intentionally draw bad, and they draw bad very well. That doesn't make sense, but, right? They're very good at drawing poorly. Um, and then on the other side, not people who are, are very good at drawing poorly, but are very good at drawing well, was someone like Hanawa, Hanawa Kazuichi. Um, he had one book from later on. He was, there's a book called Doing Time by Hanawa, uh, published in Japan in the 90s. It's about, Hanawa was a gun freak. He liked handguns, and he was subsequently arrested in Japan for having a handgun. So he made a, a, a manga, a very good manga, about his time in prison. Uh, way before that, he was doing manga like this. And if you look at a lot of Hanuwa's uh, manga from the early 70s, you'll see that someone who's very famous like Maruo Suihiro did not really come up with this style of uh, recycling uh, pre-World War II illustration for Boys Magazine, which is the kind of style you're seeing here, and doing grotesque things with it. Um, Hanuwa was doing that in the early 1970s. Um, stories about ghosts, about samurai, oftentimes highly sexual, um, fairly brutal parodies of uh, Japanese heroics during wars more distant than World War II. This one, I believe, about the Russo-Japanese War in 1905, which was finished in 1905, uh, parodying also the Meiji Emperor uh, bottom right. And this would have been significant in the early 1970s, even though the war was 70 years old. Uh, because in 1968, uh, which is obviously known globally as the year of the counterculture globally rose, in Japan also marked 100 years of uh, the Meiji Restoration when the emperor was put into power. And there was heavy, large pageants uh, celebrating the glorious history of the Japanese military past, of course, uh, totally glossing over uh, the atrocities of World War II. And I mention this also because Next year, 2018, marks the, what does it mark, the 150th um, anniversary, and the Japanese government is planning, again, uh, events on a smaller scale, uh, celebrating the 150 years of Meiji. It'll be interesting to see um, what they do. Um, most likely, like they did in 1968, it'll be kind of an opportunity to show off the Japanese uh, military. And uh, that's the end. Uh, but Gato goes on to 2012. As you can see, even it took an hour just to explain the beginnings in the first uh, five years, uh, first ten years. Uh, but one could do this with every five-year segment in Gato. Um, it's the the work, the work is as diverse as the number of issues uh, there are. Um, it became kind of a generator for new ideas in the visual arts and literary arts in Japan uh, up to the 1990s. So it's an important part not only of world comics history and Japanese manga history, but of Japanese cultural history overall. And you are very lucky because it's the first time in the US that original artwork from Gato and his artists are being shown in the United States uh, now across the street. So thank you.